Top Med Talk. Well, hello and welcome this morning to Top Med Talk. We're at Euro Anesthesia 2023 here in Glasgow, Scotland for the Euro European Society of Anesthesia and Intensive Care. I'm Desiree Chapel, your host, and I'm joined by my co-host, Monty Mythen. Hello, Monty. Good morning, Desiree. Yeah, good, ha- good morning. Happy Sunday. <laughs> it's a happy Is Sunday. Sunday. Happy Sunday. It is Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in Glasgow, which it's it's bright and sunny again, which yeah. is uh, apparently unusual. We should, we should heard. stop being surprised by that. It's not good for the <laughs> Scottish Tourist Board to, well, to keep was, being surprised know, that it's no, sunny no, no, in no. Scotland. I know. We should well, say, once again, as always. Well, as always here in sunny Scotland. Mm. Uh, anyway, here, day two of uh, the ESAIC Euro Anesthesia 2023. Good times. Very good times. Ex- saying yesterday, extremely buzzy yeah. You know, section that we're in here, which is the trade exhibition and the posters and socializing space. I referred to it yesterday, the busiest I've seen for a long time, which yeah. is great. I think com- the post-COVID confidence is all back now, Yeah, which I think is good. And people, th- people like to be together. People like to go to, to meetings and yeah. to gather and to discuss. Lots of good conversations. You know, everyone, lots of hugs and, and uh, good to see everyone. So, um Monty, we have another voice joining us uh, today on Top Med Talk. Andy comes to you. Hi, Andy. How are Hi, you? Hi, Desiree. Good to be here. It's great, isn't it? This flood of people flooding into the exhibition hall around us with this growing coffee queue right yeah. next to us as well. <laughs> <laughs> we, Lots of coffee queues, actually. <laughs> we found yesterday, it sounds like we were in a building site, but yesterday we were right next to a barista. <laughs> 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 Which, but it's a lovely sound to hear the grinding beans. It is, and yeah. the banging of the baristas, and all Absolutely. the coffee we could drink. Actually, yeah. I think, yes. which is which is good. We were busy yesterday. I think we did about six interviews on Top yeah. Med Talk. You can find those at topmedtalk.com if you missed those yesterday. Uh, we are live streaming today, and we'll be uh, throughout the rest of the day today. So good, good stuff. Well, Andy, thank you so much for joining us. Now, Andy, yesterday we were uh, talking about the opening ceremony. We were, yes. Yes, and how wonderful it was. I know we did hear some bagpipes, which was really cool. Yeah. But the keynote speakers were uh, especially good. They were especially good. Yeah, I really enjoyed both keynote talks. Um, two very different talks, which, again, we talked a bit about yesterday. One from Nadine Montgomery with a very moving, kind of powerful personal account of some of her experiences and how that impacts yeah. us as clinicians taking consent going forwards. Yeah. And then after that, uh, a really very different talk which we're going to hear a bit more about we now are, well, with our, we, next our next guest, guest yeah. we're so lucky to have one of our it's keynote fantastic. speakers here today on top med talk jean louis vincent thank you so much for joining us today good morning it's a pleasure i'm very happy to be here thank yeah, you absolutely well we've heard a lot about your keynote uh uh keynote presentation yesterday lots of good stuff very provocative is, is what we've heard as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jean Louis, for those who may not know you, I don't know if there are many people out there listening today who don't. <laughs> uh, tell us just a little bit more about where you're from and a little bit about your background. I am professor of intensive care medicine at the University of Brussels, and I have been a full time intensivist for many years. <laughs> I was the president of the uh, European Society of Intensive Care Medicine a while ago. I'm also a past president of the World Federation of uh, Intensive and Critical Care Societies. And um, I have an interest in virtually all aspects of uh, Uh intensive care medicine. So Mm -hmm. I was very honored to be invited again by this society and to give this opening uh, Ibsen lecture. Yes. Uh, I I enjoyed it very much. It was a real privilege. Yeah, very good. Well, Monty, you might be able to tell us, and and then Jean-Louis key in here, but this used to be the European Society of Anesthesiology, correct? Yes. Yeah. So this was the European Society of, of Anesthesia and recently ESA. changed to yes, yes. And recently <laughs> changed to become the ESAIC. Mm-hmm. We have to remind ourselves that the specialty of critical care is relatively young. Yes. So I mean, it's not that long ago. With the young man sitting next to me, that the <laughs> the sort of the main meeting in the world, which it still is for critical care, was run mm-hmm. by Professor Jean Louis Vincent in Brussels and is so well established and so well known, it's literally known as the Brussels meeting. Mm. Now, we, as we travel that journey, it's, it's great to notice that many of their organizations are embracing critical care as being a subspecialty, and the European Society of Anesthesia added the IC recently to recognize that many, but far from all, right. critical care specialists come from a background of anesthesia. John, what do you what do you think about? That? No, no, I fully agree with what you said, and uh, 
uh, even journals added in uh, critical care medicine to their title. The Blue Journal, the American Journal of Respiratory Disease, is a good example. Uh, it added and critical care medicine. And, um, well, critical care medicine has been uh, now established uh, on its own. It's a specialty by itself. But nevertheless, as you say, uh, many intensivists in Europe have a background in anesthesia. In some, some other places as well, but less so in the U.S., where most intensive care doctors have a background in uh, internal medicine or respiratory disease, more specifically. So to reflect on the sort of birth and the growth of modern critical care, I was working in London as a young doctor in the last century, you won't say how long <laughs> it was, on the unit set up by Jack Tinker, yeah. you know, very yeah. sadly departed Professor Jack Tinker. Yeah, 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 and there was sure. a picture on the wall, we had a little office in there, yeah. and there was a picture on the wall with you and David Bahari and a few other people. Uh, it was probably one of the first Brussels meetings. <laughs> how, how many people roughly went to the first Brussels meeting a little more than 200 240 or something like that and uh, and before covid the last one uh, had more than 6000 participants wow. yeah. it is still the largest in the world uh, well uh, international because when you go to china there are thousands of people uh, yes. primarily from china but um, no it's a it, it's, it's a very big meeting and after COVID now, last March, we returned to close to 5,000. So we are, we are not exactly at the same levels as before. And I'm not sure we will ever return to very, very large meetings uh, because of the developments of video conferences. And also uh, the travel expenses uh, w went up and will go up substantially, yes. the, uh, the flights in particular. Oh, yeah. So for people coming from, from Asia, Latin America, and other parts of the world, it may be uh, a bit more difficult than in the past. Yeah. But, uh, but still, as you say, I can only echo what you said before. People are eager to go back to meetings and have these exchanges. It's not just listening to talks. Now at meetings, there are more and more practical sessions with demonstrations, hand-on uh, teaching uh, courses and simulations. And so, and it's also you know, at the bar or, you know, in, uh, in the hallways. Coffee, that, that in the we, coffee uh, lounge. Uh, in the coffee lounge. <laughs> well, you, you can have a coffee in a bar. <laughs> and, uh, True. <laughs> and so, yeah. and that's where you raise new ideas and, uh, and you see what yeah. the others do practically, yeah. you know. Everything is not in the literature. We need to interpret it. We need to talk about it. And so, I am personally very pleased to see that meeting things are back yeah. in life. Yeah, back. Lots of new ideas. Andy is a young doctor, um, younger doctor. <laughs> new, newer. We're all young here. Yeah, that's right. We all young. We're all young. Uh, you know, your idea of what meetings are like, because I mean, you know, a lot of the last four years has been very different yeah, and that's really different. during a training period for Absolutely. you. What does this mean to you? I think it's great to see people coming back in person. I've, I've really enjoyed the, uh, as you say, video conferencing coming in and being able to meet people easier without that travel over the kind of pandemic has been fantastic for trainees who can't necessarily always get the funding to go to travel to those meetings that's been brilliant but it's really nice being back in a face-to-face -face environment where you can chat to people in person and bump into people walking around the exhibition hall and i think personally that mixture of both is quite a quite a good mix i don't know how we carry that on but I may slightly disagree with okay. you because I fully agree that during the crisis, the COVID crisis, there was no other option. But I think it's totally different to speak to a screen mm -hmm. and to speak to an audience, watching people, yeah. watching how they react, look at, uh, looking yes. at their face. It's so hard. Oh, yeah. I'm, th I'm, I'm not sure they understood what I just said there. I need to go back and uh, re-explain, etc. Yes. And... Uh, so too many people keep their screen there and do some other things in their office and yeah. they are not concentrated on the yeah. token. So I, to make a long story short, I no longer give these video conferences. I refuse to give yeah. them uh, oh, yeah. because I'm bored. I'm, I'm really fed up with these conferences. So, well, I think that there's <laughs> and many people are like me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we've all done that. Yeah. Had to give, you know, tons sure, of lectures sure, to sure. A, a black box, really, um, <laughs> which it is tough because a lot of what we do is per interpersonal communication yeah. still. Yep. Um, but I do think that there, there are pieces of what we 
share at these meetings that can be recorded and people for to watch kind of later, but that doesn't replace most of what happens at these meetings. So, you know, I, I kind of agree. I think it's a hybrid is good. Yeah. There is some communication I think is good. Well, so to the point of giving presentations and, and putting information out there and getting feedback, let's talk about your keynote yesterday mm. and the, the lecture that you gave. Because we have had a lot of people talk about some of the things that you said and, and thought it was very interesting. First, let's dive into a little bit about the AI piece. Because I think you were talking about how, you know, past, present, and future of intensive care. And, you know, AI is a hot topic in, in the world, not just in anesthesia or critical care medicine. What are your thoughts right now on how we go forward and integrate AI? Because I feel like there's been a, a giant leap and maybe there's some things that are missing in the in-between. Yeah, actually many people came to me after the talk and, and even this morning uh, uh, and to, 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 to discuss AI. And uh, these people are enthusiastic about AI, but they are telling me that their colleagues may not be. And, uh, and they, they were concerned that uh, th there are some negative attitudes towards AI. And I don't, I don't understand why. I mean, it's like having negative attitudes towards internet many years ago, you know? <laughs> how, could you be, how could you be against it? I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's a, a technological improvement that will change our lives, but for the better. If we control it, well, of course, we need to be careful. We need to proceed intelligently, of course, but <laughs> it will improve the care of our patients and make our lives easier. So we cannot be against it. But what are they scared of? They are scared of, uh, well, first of all, some are just scared of being uh, n no longer needed. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> that, that, replaced. That they, that they will be replaced by the, by the technology. That's, that's one thing. The other thing, they are afraid of errors, of mistakes mm. uh, of all kinds. Mm -hmm. And third, they are afraid of the fact that they could not buy the system. It could be mm. too costly and, uh, to, to have the, the, the real technology at the bedside. And so uh, some are afraid that it could be manipulated by some, of course, and that's, that's a risk. Uh, so there are different reasons, but uh, it just, uh, I think it's, uh, it's just fear of the unknown, a fear of something that you cannot control, at least you cannot control yet. Yes, yeah, so, so I, mean, I think the fears of what could get out of control are appropriate, and it's right sure. that we discuss all of those. But sure. if we take those three in reverse order, or at least touch on the three of them, it, it's likely that it's going to become much more accessible and affordable. In Absolutely. This, in the same way as the internet did. Absolutely. The internet became yeah. virtually I'm not afraid about there. expenses. And from the point of view of mistakes, there's no shortage of mistakes at the moment. So sure. I think I think we'll I was just going to say there's plenty of human error. That <laughs> sure, I think exactly the right. Com I the think computers can actually do that better. So I think we'll probably get better unless we but, let it get out but of control. Some people want to see no error whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, we have seen it with automated cars, and uh, yeah. okay, sometimes there may be someone dying yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in an accident, and people cannot tolerate it. You see, when you replace men by the machine, there can be. You know, there are deaths on the road yes. uh, everywhere oh, uh, every day. Yeah. So, uh, of course, there will be problems, but hopefully there will be much less frequent than uh, without AI uh, guided systems. But, but if, we, if we take the one that's most commonly touted, which is I'm fearful of losing my job in the clinical mm -hmm. space, that's, that's extremely unlikely. Oh, I yeah. mean, and, and we have a global shortage of people to do the work at the moment. So. Sure. And also, uh, doctors, light nurses, and other uh, healthcare personnel will have more time to do other things, mm. and they will have more time to talk to the patients, if mm -hmm. possible, and to the families. Right now, people complain that uh, you know there are no one around, and people are running all over the place, and uh, who will tell me exactly what's going mm -hmm. on? And so we will spend more time discussing it, including the ethical aspects, you know, the plans uh, for the future, etc. And uh, I think that will be humanely that will be very good because that's also a fear. Some people are afraid of the fact that the humane factors may disappear. But I don't think so. Uh, I, I really think that it's the other way around. People will have more time 
to spend discussing with others. The, the efficient, yeah, the efficiency that it creates. You actually, I say this as a nurse. So, so the the thought of being able to get back and actually have a conversation with my patient and my patient's family, where I'm not having to chart, I'm not having to make decisions that I'm, you know, I'm, and contemplating and, and struggling with. I can actually do bedside care, which is what patients need now. You know. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. Uh, so one more thing is that. Um, I mean, I'm really keen that we close some of the loops and people say, mm. by that I mean, you know, we already have a closed loop system, but it's got a manual interface. So we go to the bedside and we ask our nursing colleagues to keep the blood pressure at a level or keep the cardiac output at a level or keep the glucose at a level. And they're manually changing pumps to try and keep up with the variable physiology. And I think, come on, team, we, we, can, we, we should liberate that and say, we're in charge of the request, we're in charge of the direction, but the computers can help the nurses to do it, or us to do it better, easier and safer. You summarized it very, very well, and that's, uh, that's the point indeed. Why would we spend our time at the bedside to do things that, uh, that the technology could do by itself? We must be careful, though, that uh, the treatment of hypotension is not, is not limited to vasopressor administration no. oh, because absolutely. there is a risk of vasoconstriction. But that's the reason why your system should be sufficiently elaborate to add the fluid challenges to yes. it to make sure that volume replacement is adequate. And instead of doing a fluid challenge badly at the bedside, you could have it better done by the system. And when I say badly, I'm, I'm concerned by the fact that today, fluid challenges are not well done by many, many practitioners. They just say, it's oh, very give some fluid and we will see. What do you mean, give some fluid and we will see? That doesn't make sense. Or, oh, give 500 in half an hour. 500 in half an hour, <laughs> but you will never know what these 500 did. The fluid challenge is a small amount over a limited period of time during which you do not touch the patient and nobody <laughs> touches the patient if you want to look at the effects of your fluid. So you could have an AI-based um, uh, system that could do it and uh, as we see here live on air, uh, they could be, don't touch the patient, this is a fluid challenge. And the system by itself would give a small amount of fluids over a limited amount of time and would look optimally at blood flow, at cardiac output, to see whether the patient responds or not. And that would be much better than by humane action. And, and, and we've, we've seen some examples. I've seen your name on some publications that have addressed this issue, and there are other players in the space where we're seeing fluids and vasoactive medications and depth of anesthesia. So it's, it's on the edge of being a reality. And we're sitting on the Edwards Life Sciences booth. They have commercialized in partnership with some of our academic colleagues one of the first examples of this, yep. the uh, assisted Absolutely. fluid yes. management. Yeah, sure. Have sure. you had experience of, of that particular? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have some experience and... Uh, and, uh, you know, we have also published quite a bit with Dr. Justin on, uh, on this. And uh, I think it's great. I think it's great. And as I said in my, in my talk, actually anesthesia is ahead of intensive care with mm -hmm. this respect. Probably because it could be a little more simple in the operating room than in the ICU where patients have a multitude of, uh, of problems. But uh, these systems, I hope, will come quickly in the ICU. Uh, because we just need it. And that will improve the quality of care substantially. Yeah. Andrew, thoughts on this? Yeah, well, I think that leads on nice to what I was about to ask you. So another key topic you mentioned in your uh, Prop Ibsen keynote yesterday was about individualizing care as we go yeah. forward and be more personalized with our treatments. Yeah. We've just talked about AI. We've just talked about fluid challenges, about the combination of those going forward. But yeah. how, how in practice do you see that happening with, you know, me as the clinician at the bedside, I've got one patient in front of me. I've got a number of evidence-based trials to go and refer to, but they refer to a population. How do I take that data from a population in a trial to the one patient in front of me? Do I use AI? Do I use fluid challenges, a mixture of both? How do you see that happening? Yeah, um, as I alluded to uh, in my talk, um, with some improvements in... Um, in uh, what in medicine in general, people 
uh, got uh, hope that we could address a number of questions in large prospective randomized control trials targeting mortality. But we have accumulated negative trials. So for the person who wants to be skeptical and provocative, each time you propose something in the ICU, that doctor or that person could say, well, no, it has not been shown to do to improve survival. You can think of transfusions, albumin, the swan gun catheter, cardiac output measurement, CVP, you name it. Mm. So uh, at the end, people sit down and they say, well, what have these large trials really shown us? And so, indeed, hopefully, I have really struggled for that for many years now, people will return to personalized medicine. Some of my colleagues from other disciplines say, but Jean-Louis, this has always been the case. Personalized medicine has, has been there forever. That's not so true in clinical care medicine. So I think we will return to that. And we will return to individualizing our therapies. So as you say, with fluid challenges combined with vasopressors when needed, mm. adding inotropic agents when, when, uh, when needed. And you can, you can develop algorithms, you know, even including SVO2 measurements. If it's low, it means that the oxygen delivery is inadequate. You need something more. Lactate levels are not so easily interpreted. Uh, some people say treatment could be guided by lactate. That's not really true. It depends what you call guided. But you cannot give your treatment only on the basis of lactate levels because the changes are too slow. Yeah, of course. But, you yeah. know, but looking at uh, a decline in blood lactate levels when, when they are increased, some people call it lactate clearance, but that's the wrong term. It's not clearance. It's a decreased production primarily. Um, nevertheless, you should integrate variables. And for our brain, it's a bit difficult because mm. there are so many variables to be integrated. You must be a really good clinician at the bedside to be able to do that. But when you are tired on call at 3 o'clock in the morning, you really want to have some, some help. Absolutely, and, yeah. And, and so it will help to individualize our therapies. And I think it's, it's really very important. And hopefully now... People are buying in. People are yeah, really yeah. saying, yeah, that's true. That's true. Oh, I think it, they are. It, yeah. it, it took a while, but yeah. people are getting well, we, there. We had lots of talks yesterday, didn't we, yes. about individualizing therapy, both in anesthesia and in intensive care. Yeah, yeah. And I guess the kind of follow-on question from that is, as well as individualizing our therapies as we go forward, how do we individualize our research, for want of a better question? I mean, do you have any thoughts about that? Sure. Um, well, first of all, may take some time to develop it, but uh, uh, the prospective randomized control trials can evolve into adaptive designs, and we could speak about bucket trials, and uh, uh, I think the future will be based on phenotypes uh, rather than syndromes like ARDS or sepsis. We had a roundtable conference in Brussels last yeah. March on this, on phenotypes and how we could perhaps use biomarkers to guide our therapy. And I just went to a talk here where the, Dr. Bode emphasized it very well. Um, so the, the, that's, that's the future, to, to find some uh, particular signatures or particular yeah. characteristics that could uh, help us to guide our therapy. Now, so that's one way. Now, I think that large databases will also help us mm. to identify the signals, thanks to AI once again. And uh, we are getting there. We are starting to have some pretty good databases. Mm. And so if we can have these biomarkers uh, included, you know, uh, uh, I was asking recently Dr. Komorowski, who is an expert on AI, to show us how AI systems could choose the variable mm. to, uh, to take into account for a given decision. And that's really fantastic. Yeah. Uh, people yeah. like uh, Calfi in, uh, in San Francisco uh, have, have done it in, uh, in, uh, in large databases of uh, coming from trials in ARDS and showing that we could indeed identify better the patients who could benefit from corticosteroids. Mm. Mm. And just speaking about it, Dr. Hanan in Paris just received millions of euros from Europe, 
uh, and from France, from the French government, to really build uh, a, a big laboratory. I'm speaking about millions of euros, and, uh, and, and, and find better markers to see who would not benefit from corticosteroids. Mm. That's interesting too. That's the yeah. approach is not necessary to identify the patient who could benefit, yeah. but the patient who could be harmed. So don't yeah. give it. Don't give it to that particular patient. And what, what sort of markers are we going to be seeing in the future in this sort of context? Are they always going to be blood plasma biomarkers we send to the lab? Are they going to be point-of-care tests we can do at the bedside? Are they going to be a oh, mixture? Yeah. No, no, yeah. Optimally, eventually, it should be bedside tests mm. because we should have the results quite quickly. Well, it could be uh, in the meanwhile, it could be in the lab, but the results should be obtained rather uh, rapidly. When we speak about, uh, you know, simple biomarkers, we quickly go to procalcitonin, what do you think? I think it's a bit obsolete to speak about a yeah. single biomarker because we yeah. know the limitations of single biomarkers. Yeah. So, in the future, we will have combination of biomarkers that we will use uh, together. And uh, also, gene expression mm. is really coming, coming up there. There are some excellent papers in the recent literature showing that we could actually combine the signals of host response to the signals coming from the, 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 the bacteria or the virus, actually, yeah. and separate yeah. bacterial and viral infections as well. And so I think that's the future. Right now, it's still a bit cumbersome, of course, yeah. and, uh, and a bit expensive to get it. But as always, you know, yeah. we're making progress, <laughs> starting from sophisticated yeah. uh, measurement, but they will be simplified and they will be cheaper in the future. So that's really the way to go. It's very exciting, actually. Really yeah. exciting. Yeah. Monty, as a young doctor, what, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about all that? Well, I think it's I think it's inevitable. I mean, I think yeah. if we look at, as I'm saying, crit modern critical care is relatively young. It's yeah. happened in some of our lifetimes, uh, you know, from from the beginning. So, and it, and it's it, it's exponential. Yeah. So I think yeah. we're a place yeah. whereby we can bring in all the wonderful developments that are happening elsewhere and apply them at the bedside, but we've got to have an open mind. Yeah. We we have to be careful of yeah. being luddites because mm -hmm. we will be left behind. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I fully agree. Yeah. Very well said. Yeah. Jean-Louis, thank you so much for sitting down with us this it's morning. It's a pleasure. Here at your yeah, it's, it's 2023. Nice. Yes, yeah, it is. Nice conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we could hopefully... continue for some hours, if you like. I was like. just going to say, we could sit around for hours and chat. But hopefully next time we're together, we can, we can have another wonderful conversation right. and see where sure. things are. Have uh, safe travels today. Thank you again for sitting down. And thank you for listening to Top Med Talk. You know, you can always find us at topmedtalk.com. On your favorite podcatcher, you can subscribe at topmedtalk.com and on the, the podcatcher as well to get uh, push notifications when we put out new, uh, new pods. And you can follow us on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. We are there. Jean-Louis, <laughs> thank you so much. Cheers. Thank you. Have a good day. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioptive medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that. If you check out edpom.org, you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world. Many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home. Check out ebpom.org now. <laughs>